Okay, so who am I? My name is Simon Ems. Um, I'm, a, I'm a solutions architect at Temporal. Uh, I've been doing this type of work for about 20 odd years. Um, previously worked at, I've worked at lots of different startups, loads of companies you won't have heard of. Uh, point two that you might have, I worked at Gitpod for 18 months, two years, and uh, I worked at Sivo, I worked with UK government. And if you want to know more about me, there is my LinkedIn, uh, my link tree, sorry, not my LinkedIn. And bonus fact is I'm also a beekeeper and there's pictures of my bees on there. So you can go and look at that and see me in my non-technical job. And my, my expectation is today that um, the people I'm talking to here today, most of you will be on software application. That's the level my talk is. If you're not a so software application team, don't worry. Some of my best friends are not engineers. We're all friends here. Um, but that's, so this is gonna be a very technical talk in that respect. And my hope is as well that you've also got applications that are running in production. And again, my expectation is as well that even if you don't have them day to day, that a lot of your work is solving problems with reliability of your applications and your systems. Has anybody here heard of Temporal? We've had, we've got one that, so I'll take that as you want to know more about it. And has anybody heard of durable executions? This is primarily one we're talking about tonight. Okay, so that's good. So durable executions, we don't know what that is. So this is a statement I'm gonna start off with that all developers are now distributed systems engineers. So by distributed systems, I mean, you might have um, your, uh, your compute working in AWS, and you might have a managed database, which is obviously gonna connect over a network. Even if it's within your VPC, it's on, a, it's on a separate machine, it's going across the things. You're talking with APIs, you'll be using the Stripe API regularly. You don't host that. So that, again, is crossing over another boundary. That's what I mean when I talk about distributed system. And in 2025, most people are, I believe, doing that. So you get an, an application that appears simple. So this is just a very straightforward process order. And... I imagine that looks very straightforward. So you've got your prepare shipment. They want you to prepare that shipment. You're going to charge the customer. Once you've charged the customer, they're going to ship the order. And that's going to be stored in the database. And everybody's happy. It's nice and simple, isn't it? But then you've got all these other things. Well, because it's 2025, the prepare shipment, that goes into its own separate microservice. That'll be the inventory server. And that will do things in there. We've got the payment handler. So you'd be using Stripe as your payment handler. And that's, again, a different thing. And then your ship order, you're going to have a shipping service. That might go into, I don't know, something like DPD, something like Royal Mail to go and talk to their, um, their API directly. So again, there's a bit more complexity involved in that. And of course, with this additional complexity, you've then got to add other things to it. So in this example, the inventory service, if that fails, we've got to retry it so that that can then rerun and, and retry things. Our uh, uh, charge customer, our uh, shipping service, those both go over queues in order to, to go to those things as well. And with our payment handler as well, we've got to have, we've got to retry things as well because you don't want, uh, you don't want an order to go through without it being paid for because that's how ultimately we all get paid at the end of the day. And your shipping service, well, yeah, because of the amount of time this takes to get through, you might end up doing your shipping at two o'clock in the night. So you're going to be having to run a cron job to go and start those off. Because that's not going to be a synchronous operation. That's going to be asynchronous at a certain time in the, in the dead of night. So as you can see, this is getting more and more complex as we go on. Also, the other thing is, it's not talked about a lot, but actually age also is one of these things. One of our engineers, a guy called Paul Northrom, uh, is one of my colleagues who works in the U.S., um, he used to work for AWS, and he built their original payment, ship, payment system about 30 years ago. And the same basic architecture for what he built 30 years ago is still in place today. Obviously, there's a few more bells and whistles, and there's obviously been many, many upgrades. But the same basic architecture and the same basic stuff has its anti an ancestry in stuff that was built 30 years ago. And that adds complexity as well, because you've still got stuff that was built by somebody who's long since left your company. Yeah. And you've got to look at it and go, why did we hire the person? They're a bloody idiot. Everything fails as well. That's ultimately what happens. So your queue, you can get back pressure on there. Your cron service can go down. 
all of these things, every single boundary between a service can fail. And as you look in this one as well, it's even the glue between it that can fail as well. So you've got a huge amount of things that can go wrong. And this is where temporal comes in. Actually, it was a different slide. I changed the slide around last, didn't that this morning and I forgot. Um, as you can see, ultimately, customer happiness goes down the more complexity, the less reliability that you have in your systems. And ultimately, happy customers give you more money than unhappy customers. And as developers, we don't, we don't often think about customer level side of things, but ultimately, it's the customer who pays what we're doing. And the happier they are, the more money that we get at the end of, at the, end of the year. This is where Tempo comes in. So durable execution, this is just a statement that we've got. A durable execution system ensures that ensures coding your application runs reliably and correctly, even in the face of adversity. So all of those failure boundaries that I showed you on, the, on a previous slide, Temporal exists to make those go away. And Temporal is an open source programming model that provides durable execution. Now, durable execution is one of those phrases. You might look at that and you think, oh, that's a bit of marketing nonsense. So the other way to look at it is crash-proof execution. So that's what, that's what Temporal exists to do. Why is that work? stop working? There we go. So let's go back to our, our initial uh, process order. Now, this all happens in code. A lot of people, so a lot of people, who's using Kafka in their systems in here? Got a few hands going up. Okay, so that's good. And Kafka exists to solve some of the same problems as Tempor. I'm not saying nobody should use Kafka, Kafka and everybody should use Tempor because Kafka still has a very valid place in the stack in the same way as Tempor has a very valid place in the stack. Where, where Kafka comes in, you've got to know all of how it all, all works and you might not get the state management inside of what you're doing unless you do a huge amount of configuration. With temporal, the state management that you get, so the state, so every time you send something across to go to your payment service, if it fails, then the state is maintained. So if it fails at any point along the way, that can be rerun safely. So you can rerun all of your, all of your workflows at any point, they can be rerun without any failures. This is what my demo is going to be on later. So all of these things in here, the queues, the timers, the retry, and the state, this is part of what Temporal offers straight out of the box with, with zero configuration. And because it's all written in the languages that you all know, you don't have to really learn anything outside of just the library that we provide. So this is a code example here, and I've actually taken the spelling mistake of it, which I noticed earlier today as well. Um, so this is a bit of, bit of TypeScript because this is a TypeScript meter. And in this workflow, there are, very, there are four very simple events. And as you can see, that is just a very simple bit of TypeScript. So we've got a function which calls the check fraud. That's the first part, and we receive the order ID and the payment info. We then go and prepare the shipment, and that goes off to the shipment workflow. So in this example, if we prepare shipment, if that fails because of a network outage, what will happen is that automatically that will get retried, and you your prepare shipment will then rerun. And it will rerun and it will retry until it comes back and your network is back, is be happy again. So this is very simple TypeScript we've got here. And of course, functions fail if you've got a normal execution. So if you, for instance, you're just doing it just by pushing it across, any single one of those things on there, so maybe your machine cracks or your node just dies, that can cause a problem that can cause your workflow to fail. With durable executions, your functions are guaranteed to complete running with consistency and correctness. Because effectively, that gets shipped out to a separate service that manages all of the state. And then that calls the, uh, the underlying code that when, when it's ready. So this is the demo that we've all been waiting for. And um, for people at home, and anybody who wants to take a photo of it, this is the source code for the demo. And uh, we'll go through it. Okay, so um, okay. right. So this here is our demo. We have a lovely rideshare example. Now, this you know, 
in uh, in London, you've got your Boris line, and everyone can go and do that. In Birmingham, we have the Sabbath scooters. So this is the city of Birmingham come to me and said, Simon, will you will you build a ride sharing app for, Bur for the people of Birmingham? And this is our example we've got. This is me on my little scooter. And obviously, I've got a helmet because I'm a very safe rider. And this is going to be the happy path. And what happens is that every 15 seconds, there is a charge made to the Stripe API. And every an amount of distance that you've done, I think it's every 100 feet, I can't remember uh, exactly, but every time you go a bit further as well, that also makes a charge up to the Stripe account. So we can follow this in Stripe, and we can also follow this in Temple. So today, as you all can probably imagine, my name is Maria, and I'm going to put it in, and I'm going to start my ride. So as you can see, I'm moving along quite happily. You can see my live rider stats on here. So I've traveled 127 feet. I've been going for 10 seconds. In my, let's see if this works to that now. I've got a problem with this earlier. Excellent. So you can see that the, the Stripe API is being charged nicely. We've got uh, three events that have been received. And from a temporal point of view, when it comes to the workflow, this is our scooter session. So this is the temporal dashboard that you get as a temporal user. Uh, the first thing is we go and find the Stripe customer ID. That's all nice and straightforward. And we go and validate that the customer has got a Stripe account. We're all good so far. We're then going to begin the ride. So that's going to register a new ride from the scooter to, uh, to, the, to our service that we've got to go and charge for it. And then here, if, these orange things here that are happening every 15 seconds, this is a timeout to say, make another charge to the account every 15 seconds. So this is happening inside Temporal. So you don't actually have to have a network connection between the scooter and with your, with your server. And that will become more apparent later and more important later as well. And then we've got all of these things here. We've got the post distance charge, the post time charge. So every time we get a distance charge made, that gets registered. And we've also got the post time charge as well. Make sense so far? Okay, good. But of course, because we live in a world without, uh, without perfect internet, we've also got a code up for the time that somebody gets on the, bar, on the scooter and they don't have a network connection because they're in a little black hole where they've picked up the scooter from. And the little, the little machine on there that's connected to the network uh, doesn't work. So let's give you this example, the, if there is a network outage. So scooter ID 1, 2, 3, 4, simulated network outage. But again, I'm still Maria. And typing one-handed like this is quite actually difficult when I've got a room of people talk, that I'm talking to. Now in this example, so as you can see, we've had this here. The ride list initialization is taking a while. Please wait a moment. Now just for the purposes of this demo, we can't move it anywhere at the moment, but in reality, what would happen is that you'd still be able to use your scooter and you'd be able to move off, you'd be able to go and start your journey. And as far as the customer's concerned, they wouldn't know that there's a network outage. However, as you can see, that's just uh, sold itself, but let's go and see what happened underneath. So this bit here, this nice long green bar, which is also, anybody who's not colored line will see that it's also got some red stripes in there as well. Previously that was red because it was in a network outage situation. So what would happen in, in the real situation is that the customer is going off and they're riding their bike, they're completely oblivious to the fact that there's a network outage. And the bike itself would, or well, the scooter would maintain the, the process of getting all of the different charges across and it would accumulate those internally. And then when it got back to the network, which has happened here, then we're able to begin the ride and everything happens as we expect it. So we've still got the post time, we've still got the, the charging every 15 seconds. And when I move it, which I haven't yet done, we get also some additional uh, distances on there. But what we've got there is we've ended up having, without doing any additional coding, we've also got a reliable system that's, 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 that's reliable even in the face of a network outage. Let's do another example now. So we can also got, we've also got the ability to code for unrecoverable errors. Now, uh, if you recall that right at the start, I said to you uh, that we look up there and the first thing that we do is verify the rider against the Stripe API. So this one, testexample.com doesn't exist. 
but they've tried to get on. They've not got a, an account with our service yet. So let's go and unlock that rider. That email address could not be provided. But Temporal in this case has been able to look at this and go, well, we don't know what to do. Until they've, uh, until they've got a valid account, they can't use the scooter. So in this case here, uh, the find Stripe customer ID. So let's ask a developer, let's go and look at what happened here. So we can click on that and say, well, okay, the input was all fine, but then uh, here's, the, re here's the, uh, the result. We've now got customer not found error, customer not found exception. So, we've, so the temporal system has then has failed it because the developer you've told it to do so. Now, who here writes bugs? Come on, I want to see more hands than that. We've got developers here who write bugs. So let's talk about when you write a bug, because we all love writing a good bug. So in this instance, let's put that the number 9999, and let's update it to put it back to Maria. So it, it shows you the error that I want to show it at. Right. So this will trigger a bug that needs to be fixed. Right. So the right initialization is taking a while. Please wait. Now. This is my service that's been running quite reliably for ages and ages and ages. Passed all my unit tests, it's passed all my integration tests. And I'm feeling pretty happy when I leave on a Friday evening from, from my day's work. But then somebody's come back in the next day and they've said, Simon, you've broken this code. Well, let's go and have a look at what's happened then here. So we can see here that this one here, it is in a loop of trying to attempt to, uh, to fix this. So we can see that it's got a retrieval error. So let's go and look at the, the source code and see what the problem is. There we go. So the message is, the last failing we've got is invalid scooter ID 9999. Well, that's fine. I don't see anything wrong with that. Oh, hello. Invalid scooter ID, and it's giving me the line of code. So it's in source activity to line 56. So let's go to my source code. So we've gone into the activities file. We've gone to this line here. So line 56 is this error. Oh dear. If you put a nine, if you put a nine in there, it fails. I did that for a testing thing and I thought that's uh, nobody will have a nine in it. But we've we've solved that because we can see that's a problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fix the error. And I'm going to do it like a professional by just commenting out. And that's now going to get redeployed. And all of the people who um, have a scooter on. They haven't had to do anything. They've just seen this has, been, this has been updated around them. So let's go back and look at our temporal dashboard. And as you can see here, it's still failing for this, for this particular rider. But if we wait another few seconds, then this will result because I've solved this error. I've, all I've had to do is fix the bug and deploy new code. I've not restarted this workflow at any point. And one of the reasons this is very useful, I'm going to just keep talking whilst this does it in the background. It's going to back off at the moment, so it will take a little while. Um, one of the ways this is really useful, so we've got a lot of banking customers, and if you're doing some of this, you know, process order, ah, brilliant, so that has now succeeded, and all we've had to do is just fix the bug. But this is really important because some of our workflows for customers, like banking customers, they've got workflows that last for 10 years. Now, I can't guarantee that something's not going to go wrong in that 10 years, so you've got to have the ability to update what you're doing, and this and temporal gives you that flexibility. So. That there is my demo.